Good morning. Oh. Yeah, we're hold on. We might be having technical difficulties. Hopefully. That's okay. It gives me time to tune the guitar. How's everybody doing this morning? Was, <laughs> thank you, Logan. That was not very convincing. Um, we're so glad that you're here this morning. We're so glad that you're able to come and worship with us. Um, and we have we have slides, I think. That's good. <laughs> All right. Before we do anything else, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we want to thank you that you are Lord, that you're good. Um, God, we uh, we pray for this morning that you use it to shape us, use it to uh, um, help us remember where our hope is, and that's only in you, Jesus, not in not in anything this world has to offer. Um, yeah, Lord, be with us as we worship. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and stand with us.
of all, as always, if you're looking to get more involved, if you're looking to plug into the church, a great way to do that is through gospel communities and through uh, Bible studies and um, Sunday school that we have going on downstairs. If you're interested in any of those, talk to somebody at the Welcome Center or somebody who looks like they know what they're doing. Because <laughs> they might. Who knows? Um, next, um, two big ones. Uh, the first one, we have a yard sale next week from 8 to noon at Three Springs for Church. Again, it's the selling of some of the stuff that was up at camp. Um, so if you're interested in that, go and check that out at the Three Springs property. If you have any questions, just, um, again, ask the same people. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, after the 11 o'clock service, we have an FBYG First Baptist Youth Group Forum. We're going to be talking to uh, Finn Foster, who is the um, um, candidate, I guess, for being the youth minister. What was that? Oh, he, he is the person. So, so we, uh, we get to uh, just ask him questions, talk about the vision for, for First Baptist Youth Group. Um, so that'll be great if you want to check that out. Um, let's go ahead and keep singing, but before we do, let's pray. Father God, we, um, we thank you for this church. We thank you that uh, you're doing things through this church and in this church. God, we pray that, um, God, that we would just continue to be a church that's faithful to your word. Um, individually and corporately. We thank you so much um, for your word and how it shapes and moves us. Um, be with us as we continue to sing the word. Uh, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and stand with us. Amen. 
God, you are truly our living hope. Forget, or forgive us for forgetting that. Forgive us for walking away from that. But thank you so much for welcoming, welcoming us right back into that. Um, we pray that as, <clears throat> as Jimmy preaches, that it would just be a reminder of your goodness, Lord. Um, prepare our hearts to hear it. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So pray that they're able to come in here and fix what needs to be fixed because like we have our little device back here that's pretty awesome that just sends it right to the internet. But if it can't connect to the internet, that's pretty unhelpful. So um, pray that the, just pray that Spectrum will be able to come here. So we're going to be uh, in John chapter 16, the end of John chapter 16 today. Uh, like I said last week, it was appropriate for the week that we've had. Uh, no matter where you stand, Jesus has overcome the world. We are in his farewell discourse, uh, beginning in verse 16. Uh, if you'll remember, we've, we've gone over this whole long speech of Jesus to his disciples, where he's trying to remind them, comfort them, instruct them on his goodness and his grace and his giving of the Spirit, reminding them who they are and of the hope that's found in him. And so we're going to finish that up today before we go into his great prayer next week. Uh, and yes, we are going to uh, attack all of chapter 17 at once next week. So when you come in, prepare your mind. We're going to get after it. Uh, but this week we have this, this six, 16 through 33, and it's a great little section of verses. Uh, but I want to start first with a little I, little story about how um, about me uh, particularly, and about how a mindset gets changed because of basically our experience in life. So when I was uh, in my second year of kid pitch baseball, which some of you were like, where are we going with this? Sports, what are we talking about? I don't do sports, I do. Or actually what was funny is I moved here, I'm like, what sports do you play? Mountain biking, skiing, I'm like, those aren't sports, those are recreations. But anyway, um, nevertheless, nobody actually played what we would call traditional sports. So I'm in what's called this game of baseball, and in this game of baseball, it's my second year where children are throwing the ball to each other, which that sounds like a terrible idea when it comes out of my mouth. But we're in the second year of this, and I get, I get put on the worst baseball team on the planet. We won one game that year. If you don't know me, I'm a fairly competitive human. Um, I like to win. And so when I get put on the worst team on the planet, you have to figure out how to deal with losing, right? There are two ways to deal with losing. You either get mad and you break things, or you just resign the fact that resign yourself to the fact that you are going to lose. And you just kind of go, all right, just go ahead and beat me now. Like take that bat and move me over the back and just let's be over with this. I resorted to option B. I'm just going to, hey, we're we're, we're losers, and so I just can't get too high or too low, whether we win or whether we lose which is a good thing or a bad thing, but in a part of that, you kind of lose your edge for winning because you expect to lose so much. Uh, how many of you have experienced this in sports or in life? Like, man, I just keep losing over and over again, so I just go into a game expecting to lose, so why like, put all of my emotional energy into everything I do? And so this happened to me very, as a very young human being. Side note. It's ridiculous that our kids don't keep score. Uh, Amen. Hot sports opinion. Hot sports opinion. Everyone, there should be winners and losers because there are. And in winning, you have to learn how to win well and you have to learn how to lose well. Just saying. 
lots of good things about this. All I have to say. I, I learned to lose, but then I also got on a high school team. My high school uh, regular season, you know, I went to McNeil High School in Round Rock, Texas. We were awful as well. And in that, it reinforced what I had learned in a, at the younger age when we lost every game. It just reinforced, all right, we're just going to lose. And so how do I deal with this without going insane? Because I don't want to lose. It's the last thing I want to do is lose. Uh, the reason why I'm saying all of this is because I think too often we as believers in Christ, we as Christians have taken on the posture of, I expect to lose. We are always a people on the defensive. What this passage right here is going to tell us, is going to tell us something completely different. It's going to tell us that Jesus in his life, death, resurrection has overcome the world for us. And by his overcoming the world, we overcome the world. So we don't have to be on the offensive. In fact, we get to have joy in the midst of all the pain and struggle because we know the victory has been won. So let's read John chapter 16, 16 through 33. Verse 16, it says, A little while and you will see me no longer, and again, a little while and you will see me. Which is just a funny verse. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he had? He says to us, A little while you will see me, not see me, and again, a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Shocking, right? Jesus knew that they wanted to act what they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, A little while and you will not be you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow, because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. For joy that the human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. Father, we, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we get to look into the person and work of Jesus, all that he is, all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do. And God, may we be encouraged, and may we walk out of here with transformed minds, knowing that you are better and have overcome the world and truly believe that. We love you, and we pray all these things. In your wonderful and beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. So the passage starts out with a very confusing little section of verses. A little while, you will see me no longer. Again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, so what he's speaking of right here is he's speaking of his death and his resurrection. A little while, and he's going to die. In a little while, you will see me again because I will be resurrected from the grave. And it's always just this... Interesting idea when we when we use words like the little while, they're like, Jesus, what do you mean by a little while? Do you mean like a few hours, which in this case he actually does? Do you mean like a few days? Do you mean like a few months? 
Because really, if you think about it, in God time, a little while could be several years, right? Well, literally in this passage, when they're asking for a little while, Jesus is responding uh, that a little while is literally a few moments. And he knows what they're asking. He knows when they're asking, what does he mean by a little while? That, that it is not what that they're asking is what I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. He knows that they're asking these questions because in themselves they want to have just so they want to have an idea. They want to they want to ask who they believe or who they think, obviously only at this point, who the God of the universe is, if they would give them some inside information. So they would know, so they would have some of this truth. So they would really, in a sense, be able to get their minds ready and get their minds prepared for what is coming. That that this man who they had been with for three years was about to no longer be with them, but then they would see him again. And so they wanted to prepare their hearts, prepare their minds, maybe, right, maybe. So that way they would be be prepared to understand what what was about to happen. And so how does Jesus, knowing their thoughts and knowing all of their questions, respond to them? He responds, not like me, not with sarcasm, not with frustration, not like with a, hey, guys, man, why don't you just trust me? Why don't you just follow along with me? He responds with, uh, with, with something that's very simple. He responds in verse 20 with, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. I think... Man, this, this is a, such a fascinating passage, and it starts with something that is extremely, extremely pertinent to them, because there's going to be something that is about to come when Jesus dies, this man that they've been following, that really, I mean, even though they've been with him three years, and they, he, he keeps telling them over and over and over again, hey guys, I'm going to die. Hey guys, I'm going to die. Hey guys, the temple's going to be knocked down in three days, so we'll be raised back up. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Do they get it one time? No. Not at all. How can this man who raises people from the dead die? How can this man who heals the broken die? How can this man who sent who cast demons out of people die? Well, Jesus is reaffirming here that this that there's going to be something great that happens. Again, truly, truly, I say, but you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. Jesus is about to die, and they will weep and lament, but somebody else will rejoice. When somebody wins, they're extremely happy, aren't they? Like, again, think about the election. If you were on the wrong side of the election this, this year, when I say the wrong side, I mean, you voted for the other guy. You wept, in a sense. Like, in fact, like no, no other time bef- before have, in my lifetime has the loser gone, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. The world is going to end. This is the feel I get. But at the same time, I've also never felt the same thing. I've never felt the opposite reaction from the other side. Oh my gosh, this guy's other guy's going to get out of power now. And Life is going to be how it always was meant to be. Yay. This is what happens with winners and losers, right? One weeps and the other rejoices. In this case, Jesus is going to be put to death. The man who convicts them of sin, the man who convicts them of righteousness, the man who convicts them of judgment is finally put to death. He can no longer bring a people away from the Jewish practices and the Jewish religion and drag them into something else to believe in that he is God. No, he is dead. And they will rejoice. But the disciples, however, man, they are going to weep. But the beauty of this passage is we're going to see four different things about joy. And we're going to see that the first one uh, really is is that joy is revealed in the midst of our sorrow. Joy is revealed out of sorrow. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. 
These people, though the others are rejoicing, they are weeping. But Jesus has something in store for them that they, they could never imagine, they could never ask for, and really up to this point, they could never believe. He was going to overcome death. He was going to defeat Satan. He was going to defeat sin. And they would rejoice in that because they're going to be like, man, the guy that was crushed and killed by the powers of this world and God himself put him to death on the cross in order to raise him up again to defeat Satan, sin, and death for us. I see him again. There he is in the flesh. God of the universe in the flesh has overcome death. Praise the Lord. Isn't that a joyful moment for us all? But these people are going to see him in the flesh in this moment. And Jesus, by, by just this beauty of, of you know, who he is, he, he always has awesome word pictures, doesn't he? He gives them an example of what this would look like for them. He does so beginning in verse 21. He says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Uh, my birthday is coming up in a few weeks. And every, uh, every time my birthday is here, I get a phone call from my mother. Um, and she goes through, I remember, in this case it will be thir 36 years ago, uh, I went through 18 hours of excruciating labor. And I'm just like, yes, we know. I've heard this at least 36 times in my life on the hour of, of my birthday every time. But I've also been through it now. I, well, my wife has now been through it. Guys, you don't give birth. You aren't pregnant. We aren't pregnant. She's pregnant. Uh, just saying. Um, so my wife has now given birth three times, and in, in some ways she's a poor example because literally the doctors go, you were like built for giving birth. And I'm just like, that doesn't even make sense. Um, but like she has five hour labors and she's done, and it's just like boom. But uh, if you've ever been in a labor room, it's one of the most terrifying and joyful moments of your life. Like I, I'm, I'm sitting at the head holding her hand. I feel like she's about to punch me. She's gripping on my hand. Uh, just trying to get through the pain. And she's one of the ones that's just like, I'm not doing the drugs. I'm just getting through it. And we're going we're gonna to power through this and make it happen. Well, she has contractions that are uh, super short because for some reason the Lord made her like that. And so, and when I say super short, they're super short, but they're constant. And that's why she gives birth so quickly. Boom, pain, uh, done, uh, done. Uh, this is like literally for four hours straight. I'm just like... Oh my gosh. <laughs> and she goes through this, the pain is excruciating, and praise the Lord, I, just, I get to watch. Oh, and I don't have to go through it. God, girls, oh my gosh. Props to you. I'm, men are really, we're the biggest wolves, the wolves on the planet. Um, like, I get a cold, and I'm just like, I'm going to die, Lindsay. And she's like, I'm going to push a human out of my body. <laughs> Take that. And so this, this is a beautiful picture right here because, I mean, honestly, as soon as that child is born, as soon as Owen, Evie, or Johnny were born and you put, her, put him, her, into the arms of, of Lindsay, the smile that crosses her face is just something like you'll, you never experience unless you see it, right? Like there's just a, a satisfaction, a joy, and a contentment, like both. And what's funny is, like, in that moment, it's almost like she's not even thinking about it, even though the after effects are real. But there's just, like, a, a great joy that I, in my hands, I hold my son. In my hands, I hold my daughter. And Jesus is trying to give us that image of what it means for these men to see him die and how great their joy will be upon his resurrection. In fact, like, really... This image is one that is used throughout Scripture. It's used in the Old Testament. It's used in the Old Testament when the people of Israel are in extreme, extreme anguish and they're waiting to be restored by God. In Isaiah 66, it says, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall a land be born one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Shall I 
bring to the point of birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord. Shall I cause to bring forth, shut the womb, says God. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for you, all who rejoice. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious abundance. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations shall be an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse, you shall be carried upon her hip, and bounce upon her knee. And one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like the grass, and the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants, and he shall show his indignation against his enemies. He also does it for the end of time. See, gives this idea is like, really, as the world is about to end and Jesus is about to return, the world is in the birth pangs of the brokenness of life. And we feel it, we see it all around us, and we're just like, something is about to happen. The world is about to end. Which, by the way, people have been expecting since the Bible was written. And so for those of us that are like, I can't believe the world is where it's at. It's going to end any moment because things are so bad. Welcome. So has everybody else. Jonathan Edwards literally in the 1700s wrote a book that's this thick about how the world was about to end. So what we do is we wait. But these are, in a sense, the birth pangs waiting for the restoration of the world by the returning of Christ as he renews all creation and we rejoice in his overcoming. Praise the Lord. But then also, man, we ourselves too are products of the birth pangs of Christ. In John 3, we are born again. Or as the passage says, you are born from above. The birth pangs are not yours, but they are Christ, born on the cross, that you might be the benefactor of his pain. You are born anew and born again to a living hope in Christ because of what he has suffered and gone through on your behalf to your great joy. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But here's the thing. We don't honestly... Our culture does not do these things very well, does it? We don't do pain well. Uh, in fact, if there's pain involved, we avoid it at all costs, don't we? We are, we are extremely pragmatic people. Pain, don't do. This is what we do. Did it work? Don't do. We are extremely pragmatic. In fact, it's to our greatest detriment because just like these people who are experiencing the sorrow of the death of Christ upon the cross, without the sorrow, they don't experience the joy of the resurrection. In 2000, or in, in this article that I found, um, I think it was in Psychology Today, uh, there's a doctor named Lisa Firestone, and it says that uh, the question is, is our aversion to pain killing us? Is our aversion to pain killing us? A 2011 report from the CDC, which who knows if they have any credibility anymore, uh, stated that overdoses of prescription painkillers have more than tripled in the past 20 years, leading to 14,800 deaths in the United States uh, in 2008. And, and her, kind of the way she begins to explain it is, she says that when we try to submerge or alleviate pain and anxiety, we ignore their message. Pain, whether physical or mental, is trying to tell us something important. When we try to quiet our discomfort, we fail to identify its cause and address the underlying issues that lead to our suffering. The problem with trying to suppress our pain and anxiety is that when we succeed in doing so, we come, become cut off to experiencing emotion. As we engage in this pattern, we never deal with the underlying pain that thus creates a vicious cycle from which it becomes increasingly difficult to emerge. The seduction of getting relief creates a path to addiction, often requiring more and more as the apprehension of possible discomfort increases. This is not to say that this, I had to put this part in here because there's a caveat to this. This is not to say that carefully used and professionally monitored med medications are not of value. It's simply to state my concern over our gravitation toward in a society in which feelings, and, and for me what, what I thought about when I'm thinking this is, is suffering. 
is persecution. When the gravitation toward a society which feels feelings are shunned, not tolerated, or immediately labeled as a matter of medical concern, a feeling-averse culture will ultimately dehumanize us. Empathy is an essential part of our human heritage, and the more we move away from feeling, the more we move away from love, closeness, vitality, and fulfillment. If Jesus and his disciples avoid the suffering, what happens? We are lost in our sin, and we are judged by the God of the universe. But thanks be to God that in Christ he suffered on our behalf, and he paid the penalty for our sins. But not only that, but God has a promise to us in our pain. So we don't need to avoid it, but we need to address it. Because 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, it says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is renewed, being renewed day by day. There is hope in the brokenness of the world that you're feeling. Isn't that good? Because otherwise it's all for nothing. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparisons. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, eternal. In our affliction and in our sorrow, Jesus is at work. How do we know? Because we have an empower and example in Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us... Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endur endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, of, and the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We have to see our suffering and our brokenness in light of the cross and in light of the person of Jesus. It's not for nothing. In truth and in reality, for the joy set before us, we endure our present sufferings because he has overcome the world and his promise is greater than we could ever ask or imagine. The victory is better. And so again, number one of this is joy is revealed out of our sorrow and I think we see it plainly there. But not just that. Our joy cannot be overcome and it cannot be taken away. Look at verse 22. It says, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. When our joy is taken, it's because we literally put our joy in our own hands and we go, Here. Take it, world. Some of us believe, and I say some of us, I am the worst. I am the worst of all sinners when it comes to this. Some of us believe there is more power in the brokenness and the sin of the world than the resurrection of Jesus. There is more power in the brokenness and sin in the world than there is in the power and the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. And we believe this is true. This is why we get lost. This is why we lose our joy. This is why we become cynical and we lose our hope. Because we forget that nothing can take away our joy. Jesus is the holder of all of our joy, not us. And so we look to the one who holds our joy, who is the fullness of joy, and we run to him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who will give us the joy we so hope for, that we so long for, that we look for in other things. And so typically, you know what? If we are, feel like we're joyless, it's because we're looking in for, for joy in places other than Jesus. If we are joyless, it's because we are looking for our joy in something other than Jesus. It's because we've gone, you know what? God, I can go find, I, I know you say you're, you have fullness of joy, and my joy can't be taken away, and my joy is found in Jesus. But we go, but you know what? I don't really trust that. I think I can go find it in this thing. I think I can find it in this job. I think I can go find it in this person. I think I can go find it in this money. And so we offer it up on a silver platter, and then we find that it will never satisfy us. And our joy, honestly, when you buy something, isn't it nice? But how long does it take to go away and go, you know what? I need something else. I need that next thing. 
Or, you know what, I'm in this relationship, and as I'm in this relationship, it's awesome for like the first several months. But then I get tired of it, and I realize that this person is just as jacked up as me. They're, they do all of these things that bother me. They're, they have these shortcomings. They have these failures. So I need to go find something else. I need to go find another relationship. And so we put our joy on a silver platter and go, hey, world, provide me joy. That joy will always, always, always fail. But Jesus provides a joy that cannot be taken away. Number three, joy is refreshed in prayer. Read verse 22 through 23. It says, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. In, throughout Scripture it says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. Joy in God, it melts into worship, doesn't it? When you truly experience the joy of God, you're like, God, thank you for this. Like, when you have a kid born, when, like when my children were born, I'm like, it, you just have an overwhelming sense of joy. Like, this, God, you have given me this child. You have given me this great joy, and nothing is going to take that away. And my mind immediately goes, thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for this. Like, I, I, I know Lindsay gives birth, but, I mean, the first thing I do is go, God, thank you for this gift. True joy always turns into worship of God. If joy terminates on something, it was not true joy at all. But true joy turns into worship. And into worship, when, it, when your joy turns into worship, then it turns into will. Because our minds are transformed by the glory of God in Christ. He transforms us. He helps us to love the things he loves. He helps us to hate the things he hates. And we believe and we run to the God of the universe through whom we have fullness of joy and we petition him. We pray to him. And in our prayers, in our communion with God, he restores us. He renews us. And he answers our prayers. And when you have an answer to prayer, man, isn't there just this, un, just this subversive feeling of contentment and joy that God is actually at work? He is actually on the move. Do we get that? Do you feel that? Do you gain that hope? Joy is found in your prayers. In verse 25 to 27, 8, through 28, it says, I have said these things in figures of speech to you. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say this to you, that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Jesus is interceding on our behalf as we go to the Father, as we rejoice in His goodness and His grace to us in Christ, as our hearts and our minds are transformed to be like His, to fall into His will, and as we pray to Him and the Father hears our prayers. Isn't that a great and fulfilling truth for us? The God of the universe, when you pray, hears you. You are not alone. In fact, Jesus says that in, in a few verses that when the sheep are going to be scattered, his father will still be with them. If you feel like your world around you is crumbling and all of the sheep have scattered, all of the people, all of the relationships, you know who has not left you? The father. God has not left you. He is with you and he is hearing you. And when you come before him and you lay your cares, your concerns, your petitions before the God of the universe, your praises, he restores you with great joy and reaffirms in you all that he is and all that he's done, that he will not leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't that bring us great joy? And, and here's the thing, we, we can't forget that that's true. Again, so often I'll, I'll just start praying because I'm supposed to. How many of you have this? I start praying because I'm supposed to. And you know what I'm looking for in that moment? Is I'm looking to check a box. God, I did what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to pray. 
I'm not coming before the God of the universe with my heart, my mind, my emotions, and just saying, God, I need you. Help me to remember all that you've done. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. If we pray these things, God will be faithful. If our minds are right, God will be faithful. If we remind ourselves that in prayer, God brings us joy, praise the Lord, he will be faithful to do that if we would just trust him. And Jesus continues um, in verse 29 through 30 for us by reminding us of his fun disciples. And it says in verse 29, it says, His disciples said, Ah, oh, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Which, I mean, hasn't he been saying this all of the Gospel of John? Like the same thing over and over and over again? Uh, how many of us always need to be beat over the head about 34 times before we actually get it the first time? Because our expectations aren't in line with the will of God. Like, we don't understand what God's doing, and so it takes him about 34 times, and even a change in circumstance or some sort of sorrow pressing on us for us to go, oh, that's it. All right, I get it now. Every time. And how does Jesus respond to them? Do you now believe? And if it's me, I'm like, really? Do you believe all of a sudden now? But there's something to this. Um, right, because really this is the whole theme of the Gospel of John. In fact, later, earlier we heard in this statement, Peter had already made a declaration that he was going to follow Jesus wherever he goes, but Jesus, but Jesus told Peter, hey, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me, and he's going to deny him three times. And he says, Jesus follows it up with, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me, and I, and do you believe now? Well, you're going to leave me. So I'm not sure which one that says here, guys, but I would have to go with no on that. I don't think you really believe it because you aren't believing the truth about what I'm telling you. And so he will scatter them. Uh, in Matthew 26, 31, it says, Then Jesus said to him, uh, which is just kind of a parallel passage, uh, it says, Then Jesus said to them, You will fall away because of, the, of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. These men, the one who believe, the ones we hold up on the pedestal, as the, as the guys that we kind of go, hey, I want to be like a disciple. These are the ones who don't believe. And it's, it's interesting what the expectations we have for ourselves and our strength and our perseverance and my ability these guys walk with Jesus and they still scatter. One theologian says, It is part of the character and genius of the church that its foundation members were discredited men. It owed its existence not to their faith, courage, or virtue, but to what Christ had done with them. And this they can never forget. So these men, these men that say, Hey, we believe you now. It's going to be revealed that do they or do they not believe? I'm not sure in this moment, but I know what they do. They don't have the backbone to stay. They will be scattered when their shepherd is struck. But what's beautiful is that Jesus, by his grace, doesn't leave these men there. In fact, he gives us a fourth kind of joy in a fourth place we can find joy verse 16, or verse 33, chapter 16, verse 33, it says, I have said these things that you, to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So you're going to fail and you're going to scatter. And I have said these things because in this world you're going to have tribulation, but behold, I have overcome the world. What we have to realize, and, I, and, I, and again, I, one of the things that I think we miss, but as we, as we grow up, as we get older, we find out that this is something that is unbelievably true. In this world, you will have tribulation. Guess what? That's a blanket statement for everybody. There is no one that will avoid tribulation. 
I think sometimes we believe that if we just kind of set up life right, I can avoid pain. I can avoid suffering. This is the point of the whole illustration before. I can avoid pain. I can avoid suffering. I can make it on my own strength and power without having to feel the pain of this world. What does this passage blatantly say? In this world, you will have tribulation. In this world, you will have tribulation. In fact, one of the passages that we love to quote so much uh, is in Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27. It's the uh, man who builds his house on the rock. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and, and, it, and great was the fall of it. And, and I love that because it's just like, what we take from that is, build your foundation on the rock. And as long as you build your house on the rock, you're going to be great, you're going to get through it, everything's going to be awesome. Minus the fact we forget the whole part that the storm still hits the house on the rock. But the hope of the gospel is that if your foundation is Christ, Christ is the one who has overcome the world. And church, this is what we need to hear. Jesus has overcome the world, not us. Jesus has overcome the world, not you. And, and that kind of goes a little bit contrary to what our culture would tell us. Like, you're an overcomer. You're a winner. And if you're in Christ, you are. But it's not because of anything you do, but it's because of what Christ has done. The verse really says... But take heart, I have overcome the world. Your joy, your overcoming, your victory is all because of Christ. Amen. Not because of what you have done, not because of anything you can do, not because of anything or any strength that you can build up, but because Jesus defeated Satan, sin, and death on the cross for you. You get to be a partaker of his victory. Praise the Lord. 1 John 5, 4 and 5, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Praise the Lord. So in your storms and tribulations, you have overcome the world because you've been born of God if you believe in Christ. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The victory is won. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our joy and our victory is found in Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, to whom we look for all joy, direction, life, hope, peace, joy, all of these things. It's all in Him. It's not in us. And so we have to make sure our minds remember who this author is. John 1, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the light, not us. Colossians 2, 13-15, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of the flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us and its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to opening shame by triumphing over them in him. The victory is won in Christ. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter what job you're working. It doesn't matter what place you live. It doesn't matter what circumstance is going on in your life right now. The victory is assured in Jesus, not in those things. Our minds have to change. We have to remember and we have to rejoice and we have to rely upon the victory found in Jesus, not us thinking we're going to find victory in this world. How often does this just come up short for us, right? Over and over, I'm going to find victory in the world by working really hard or doing this, or this person would be in political power, or this person not in political power, or so on and so forth. God holds the kings of this earth in his hands, and he moves them whichever way he wants. He does the things that he wants to do. Our victory is in him, 
not here. This is not where our citizenship lies. It's in heaven. And so we have to move our hearts and we have to move our minds and we have to repent that we're going to find all we ever would hope for, all that we would ever long for here. We have to find our joy in the one who is the victor of this world. But then in the midst of this, we get to be a people who in the midst of our misunderstanding, our pain, our tribulation have joy because there is a God in heaven who has overcome. So we can take joy in our prayers, petitions, and our communion. We can love people because God has overcome the world. So no matter what they do to you, you can love them with the love of Christ, knowing God is at work in you and at work in the world. And you get to be a fragrant offering to the Lord as you offer yourself in love to the people around you. And God goes, well done, good and faithful servant. I have overcome the world. I have victory here. And in your action, you are showing my victory in you. Praise God. I get to engage the God of the universe who has overcome my sin and, and I have restored relationship with the God of the universe so I can know who God is, what he has done, and I can relish and take comfort and I can be content in a life that constantly presses on me and crushes me and I can go God you have overcome this my hope is not found here or in my circumstances but in you and the fact that you overcame on the cross and there is something waiting for me on the ahead and that is a place in the Father's house with many many rooms so take heart but not only that we get to make disciples of the victorious king. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us, through us, through us, the victor gives us his victory, who spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, for we are the aroma of Christ. We are the aroma of his victory. To God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. The other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? We get to be the fragrance of Christ. We get to be the uh, ministers of reconciliation in the world. We get to be the message of the victory of God over all circumstances and all people. So church, let's walk in a new way. Not in a defensive posture like we have to hold on to what is ours. No, we need to walk into in what is actually ours right now, which is the victory of Jesus on the cross for us. Defeating Satan, sin, and death for you. We are not the defeated ones. We are the victorious ones. No matter where we stand, no matter our political positions, no matter our age, character, race, gender, if you believe in Jesus, you are a victorious one because we believe and have faith in the victor. Amen. And so we get to walk now, daily life, day by day, moment by moment, not in victory, not in loss, not in fear, not with bitterness, resentment, cynicism, but we get to walk in hope. We get to walk in peace. We get to walk in contentment because our victor has assured us the victory. And Jesus is the world. He has overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you have overcome the world. God, change our minds today. Change our hearts Help us to walk in the newness of life that we've been given. Help us to walk in the freedom of the gospel and the hope of the gospel. Help us to not trust the things of the, this world. In fact, God, forgive us when we so often do. Forgive us when we so often think that the things of this world are going to bring us hope, that they're going to bring us joy and peace and contentment and all these things. But God, then we find out that in the end, they lead nothing but to the same place where we were. And so, God, may you overwhelm us with your victory today, that you have overcome the world. So help us to take heart, to trust you, to walk in faith this week with a different mindset. One, not a victim, but a victor.
not because of anything that we have accomplished or any victory we've won, but because of the victory you have won for us. And that means we get to walk in humility. So help us to do that this week. Help us to walk in you, help us to walk with you, and help us to rejoice in all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you will do. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, we're gonna we're gonna sing a new song. It's called "Up Praise the Name Anastasis," which that's um, Greek for the word resurrection. Um, and before before we do, I just want to highlight um, something in this song. Again, thinking through hope, thinking through the hope that we have in Jesus, um, looking forward to the hope that we have of His return. Um, verse four it says, um, "He shall return in robes of white. Uh, the blazing sun shall pierce the night." And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. And this ties into um, this verse that we're gonna we're gonna read. It says this, it's first John 3, 1 through 3. Um, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that um, <laughs> that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So let's keep these, these verses in mind as we, as we sing this new song. We'll praise the name. Go ahead and stand with us.